Scriptus presents the audiobook Your Drum, written and read by the author, Kevin Stock. Copyright 2016. Production copyright 2016 by Scriptus LLC. Dedication. This story is dedicated to the dreamers. This is for the believers. This is for the difference makers who dare to cause a ruckus and challenge the status quo. This is for the outliers who risk imagining, exploring, and creating. This is for the bold, the inventors, the achievers, those who pick themselves. This is for the unconventional, the non-conformists, those courageous enough to stand on the other side of the majority. This is for the remarkable. This is for you, the engine, the power, the force that carries the world forward. This is for you, who are unapologetically you. Before diving in, I want to take a second and go off script to thank you. Your time and your attention are priceless, and choosing to spend some of that time with me means a tremendous amount. So thank you for your time, and thank you for the trust that accompanies sharing that time with me. Whether we've known each other our whole life or we're just meeting each other now, I want to express my deep gratitude and appreciation for you. I also want to tell you something about you, something I know to be true about you, and that is this. You can do anything you want. You are in control. You can achieve whatever you desire, and you can and will pick yourself up when life knocks you down, and life is going to knock and you're going to answer. I believe in you. We all need someone in our corner, and I'll be in your corner if you'll have me. I believe in you. Now go be you. Part one, dreams. Maybe the world was right, he thought to himself. Maybe it was a mistake. Six months ago, the young doctor closed his practice. He believed he had uncovered the secret, the answer to the epidemic, and he was risking everything to focus on developing a device to help people sleep. Joseph had only been a doctor for just over a year. In the solitude of his lab, he wondered if the naysayers were right. Who was he to invent something? What did he know? Who did he think he was? These were the questions Joseph was sure his friends, family, and colleagues were asking behind his back. His parents feared he had thrown it all away. They wondered why he couldn't be more level-headed like his three brothers. Joseph's older brother was an established, highly respected and regarded surgeon. An influential voice in the medical community, he had the prestige and respect that Joseph only hoped he could achieve someday. Joseph had two younger brothers as well. The youngest was a banker with much promise. Zachary had rapidly moved up the corporate ladder. He knew good deals and wise investments when he saw them. He also had a keen sense when people who needed loans would be unable to repay their debts. His lending prudence seemed harsh to many, but his bosses praised it. Joseph's other brother was a lawyer who specialized in collecting debts. He and Zachary made a good team. Everyone around Joseph wondered what was wrong with him. By all accounts, he had made it. He was a doctor. He had esteem, a high income, and a secure future. He had spent his entire life getting to this point. After years of study, struggle, and sacrifice, he had made it. And he was throwing it all away on some hunch, some idea, some crazy theory he devised. Sitting with his head in his hands, Joseph couldn't help but think that maybe the naysayers were right. Maybe he should forget about this invention, bury the idea, act like it never occurred to him, and see if he couldn't get back to somehow practicing medicine. Sighing, Joseph raised his head, sitting by the lone window in his tiny one-room apartment, his lab. He stuck his head out the window, hoping to catch the breeze. Beads of sweat rolled down his face. The summer heat was relentless, especially since he had turned off the air conditioning the week before. He'd bet all his savings on the device's development. What little money he had left needed to go to food, not cool air. As he wiped a bead of sweat from his forehead, he turned to stare at the periodic table of elements that hung above his workbench, his simple wooden table that sat in the middle of his apartment. Before becoming a doctor, Joseph had studied chemistry. This was a recommendation from his parents. 
At the time, Joseph had no interest in chemistry, and frankly, he found it quite impractical. However, because of the rigor of the chemistry curriculum, it increased his likelihood of being able to become a doctor. So Joseph didn't fight it. Becoming a doctor sounded like a good idea. Doctors made a good, consistent, and stable income. They were respected among the community and provided a worthy service to their fellow neighbors. To Joseph, it sounded nice. It sounded like a good career. It sounded like a good life. So he pushed through chemistry. The periodic table became his constant companion. Joseph worked hard to memorize the elements, their atomic weights, charges, and affinities. He came to see the world through the eyes of elements, atoms, and molecules. What fascinated Joseph and lightened the burden of his studies was the periodic table. To Joseph, the elements organized on this chart represented the building blocks of life. With knowledge of the periodic table came an understanding of how things were created from their purest forms. During his studies, these building blocks represented an erythral concept. Now, they were frighteningly relevant to his survival. For the past six months, Joseph had stared at the periodic table for hours. He hoped it would speak to him and tell him the answer to what he had been looking for. The device he had squandered all his money to create needed to be compatible with the body, soft and integrated, and yet also have the functional capacity of mechanical moving parts. Joseph had been looking for material that could function like a reliable metal, yet was soft like rubber. He was convinced the periodic table held the solution to his dilemma. Sitting in the windowsill, he found himself once again staring at the periodic table. This time, however, something was different. Joseph couldn't shake a nagging feeling. Something is missing here. After four grueling years of chemistry study, Joseph was accepted into medical school. He was reluctantly excited. At his medical school orientation, he recalled the dean telling the class, You've made it. The hard part is over. You've all been accepted. You are here, and in no time you will all be doctors. The problem was, Joseph didn't feel as if he had made it. He felt like he had four more years of punishment ahead of him. Worse, he felt that his last four years of punishment were a waste. He didn't need physical chemistry, organic chemistry, quantitative analysis, or chemical engineering for any of his medical studies. Except for providing some insights into medicine formulations, chemistry was basically useless. The education system had never made sense to Joseph. To him, it seemed every class was a stepping stone to get to some final destination of actual, applicable knowledge. It seemed like the system was designed to weed people out rather than usher them into the life they desired. It seemed backwards. Instead of choosing what one wanted to learn, a student had to do everything possible in the hope of being chosen. Instead of picking, students were trained to be picked. The system rewarded the art of jumping through hoops, adhering to red tape, and following instructions. Nonetheless, after another four years of little sleep, lots of caffeine and stress, it was over. He had made it. Or, so everyone said, again, he was a doctor. Strangely, at graduation, Joseph didn't seem to feel like the other newly minted doctors. They were rejoicing. They had made it. Prestige, money, and a life of safety and security were theirs. Instead, the two letters before his name, DR, made Joseph feel even more restricted. At the time, he wasn't sure why. Little did he know that in less than a year, it would become overwhelmingly clear. Upon graduation, Joseph opened his own practice. It was a bold move for a 26-year-old brand new doctor. Most doctors flew under the wings of a hospital or a large healthcare conglomerate. Their schedules, salaries, and scope of practice were set by the organization. To Joseph, there was something about working for a big hospital or a bureaucratic organization that was off-putting. It seemed restrictive, just like the two letters before his name. During his first day in his new practice, Joseph caught a glimpse of his future. As he was examining a patient, checking his vitals, and taking a health history, Joseph watched as the patient slowly blinked his eyes. His head drooped, then jerked back up suddenly. He was fighting to stay awake. Finally, he slumped forward with his chin resting on his chest. From the silence emerged booming snores. Joseph looked at him incredulously as snores shook the walls. Then there was silence. 30 seconds passed. Joseph looked at the clock. 45 seconds. One minute. 
Still silence. Just as Joseph went to shake his patient awake, a frantic gasp erupted from the man, which woke him up. He shook his head and opened his eyes. As he gathered himself, he apologized for drifting off. Strangely, these mid-appointment naps became commonplace. Joseph wondered if he needed to liven up his appointments to keep his patients from slumbering and mid-conversation. The trend persisted. People were tired. They were exhausted. What is going on here? Joseph wondered on a seemingly daily basis. Due to the preponderance of patients who couldn't keep their eyes open, Joseph changed his exams. He began to ask every patient about their sleep, energy, and vitality. Do you need to nap during the day? Joseph would ask. Do you feel tired or drift off easily? To his surprise, patients admitted that they often found themselves drifting off at inappropriate times, such as at work and in the middle of the afternoon. They often felt exhausted for no good reason. Even getting out of bed in the morning was a burdensome and monumental task for many. Doctor, I feel like I just need to lie down constantly, a patient explained to Joseph one morning as she sat on the exam table. After being in bed all night, you would think I'd want to get up and get going. But after the struggle of getting up, I can't wait to lie down again. I don't have the energy to get up and about. When did you start to notice this? Joseph asked. I guess I'm not exactly sure, she continued. I remember in school it seemed I could burn the candle at both ends. But I was young. Life was a crazy adventure then. Any given day it seemed like anything could happen. I guess being on my toes was the only option. After school and my first job, I still felt good. I was a low-paid actress doing plays here and there. I loved it, though. Being on stage, in front of the lights, entertaining. It was thrilling. She smiled at the memory, and Joseph noticed energy in her voice for the first time as she thought back to her youth but it was completely unsustainable. A few years later, I got a regular job with normal hours and higher pay. It was probably about a year or so after settling down as a grown-up that I started to notice the fatigue. Okay, Joseph said while taking notes. Here are your prescription refills. The pills with the red label should help with your energy and headaches, and the pills with the blue label should help with the depression. Got it. Thank you, doctor. Day after day, Joseph witnessed more tired patients, more depressed patients. When he analyzed his medication inventory, he discovered that pills to help with depression, fatigue, and headache were the number one sellers. Maybe it's certain foods or lack of exercise or something, Joseph searched his thoughts for answers. He also searched journals, books, and research publications, which all proved to be lacking. Joseph reached out to colleagues and friends to see if they were encountering the same symptoms among their patients. One after the other told Joseph that it was normal and not to worry about it. Joseph thought they were hiding from the liability and responsibility under the corporate umbrella that employed them. These doctors followed directions, obeyed rules, and did as they were instructed. Anything that would change their protocol or disrupt the status quo was not to be entertained. Joseph was resilient, though. He wasn't going to pawn off responsibility. He kept pushing for answers. Joseph reached out to every medical professional he knew. He even organized a regional gathering to discuss this strange phenomenon. He rented out a large hall where all could sit and discuss. On the night of the gathering, Joseph was alone. No one showed, not even his brother, the surgeon. The more he tried to uncover answers, the more ostracized he became among his peers. But Joseph couldn't just let it go as his colleagues advised. Joseph began to accept that he was on his own with this one. People are tired because they don't get enough sleep, Joseph reasoned. But both tired patients and energized patients say they're sleeping fine. It didn't add up. She was bleeding from head to toe, scraped knees, elbows, forehead. Rachel's mother had ordered her to stay out of the woods. But Rachel couldn't help herself. The woods called to her. She constantly dreamed about exploring the hills, climbing the trees, and playing in the nature on the other side of town. You're too young, you're a girl, and the woods are dangerous, her mother lectured in response to her pleas. But Rachel never was good about following rules that didn't make sense to her. Rachel and her friends took off exploring in the woods just outside of town. They climbed up the hills and trees and came upon a 15-foot high cliff with a small, shallow stream rushing below. 
A massive oak tree stood on the edge of the cliff. A perfect vine hung from its branches, obviously designed by God to be swung out over the stream below. The adventurous spirits of the young girls looked at the vine with pure thrill. There was no need to ask what to do. Rachel grabbed the vine, tugged on it, and then took several steps back. With a running start, Rachel catapulted out over the embankment. She screamed with delight as she soared over the stream below. As she swung back on the pendulum towards the top of the cliff to safety, the vine tracked right to the trunk of the oak from which it hung. Rachel slammed into the tree trunk and dangled from the vine above the stream, which was flowing 15 feet below her. Rachel swayed back and forth over the stream until her friends were able to pull the vine and their friend to safety. Once back on solid footing, Rachel and her friends looked at each other, fell to the ground, and laughed. It wasn't until Rachel arrived home to the berating of her mother that she even realized she was hurt. What did I say? Her mother scolded. I told you not to go into those woods. Now let's get you to the doctor. Rachel's smile and energy was still upon her when she arrived at Dr. Joseph's. Hi, doctor, she said to Joseph. How are you feeling? Joseph asked with a tone of concern as he started patching up the wounds. Great! My friends and I just discovered this amazing new vine we can swing from in the woods. And it's the last time you'll be swinging from it, Rachel's mother sternly interjected. Even with open wounds, Rachel had excitement and energy that Joseph hadn't seen in his office in quite some time. Rachel, ignoring her mother's demand, continued to tell Joseph about the woods and the amazing tree from the perfect vine for swinging. I'm glad to see you're okay, Joseph said, and he leaned in close, whispering into her ear. But next time, swing out at an angle so you miss the tree trunk when you swing back, Joseph smirked, and Rachel smiled back with a nod. The emergency appointment set Joseph's schedule back. The waiting room was full, but he didn't mind. Rachel's energy and enthusiasm were infectious. He felt good. If only more of my patients had the energy of this adventurous girl, Joseph thought as he walked into the next room. His next patient was a new patient, 52-year-old Tom. He sat on the patient table wearing a fine suit. His shoes shined and his tie rested in a perfect knot on top of his designer button-down shirt. How you doing, Doc? Tom exclaimed with a big smile. I'm doing great, thank you. How are you? Fabulous. That's great, Joseph said, shocked to see two patients in a row with lots of energy and enthusiasm. As Joseph proceeded with the exam, he noticed Tom's watch. He couldn't help but think his house cost less than what Tom was wearing on his wrist. Joseph launched into his standard questions. So, how was your energy during the day? I would say great. I sleep great. I had a wild dream last night, let me tell you. Joseph's face blanched. He felt as if he had just been struck by a lightning bolt that turned on a bright light bulb inside his head. That's it, Joseph muttered out loud, unintentionally. What's it? Tom dubiously looked at Joseph. Sorry, Joseph smiled. Your energy, your dream, it all makes sense. Joseph paused, gathered himself, and soaked in the moment of revelation with a wry smile on his heart. Let me explain, Joseph started. Tom, I see patients every day who are burdened with fatigue, depression, constant lethargy, and headaches. They lack energy and vitality and the desire and excitement of life. I have been searching for an answer to to get to the root of the problem instead of masking the symptoms with medications. I have been looking for the cause so that we can fix the problem instead of just treating the effects. Joseph paused and Tom interjected. So what do you think the root cause is? Dreams, Joseph smiled. Dreams? Tom shot Joseph a curious look. Exactly. People aren't dreaming. You see, there are different levels of sleep. One of the deepest levels of sleep is called REM sleep, or rapid eye movement sleep. It's the stage of sleep when we dream. The fact that you're dreaming means that you're getting deep, restful sleep. And that's why you have the energy and feel great during the day. Joseph was on cloud nine. He deciphered the code. Or so he thought. Oh, I always dream, Tom said, smiling, seeing the light in Joseph's eyes. And that's why you have the energy and good health that you do. 
it all made so much sense to Joseph now. Joseph knew, or at least had a theory, why so many of his patients were tired, exhausted, and depressed. They weren't dreaming. They weren't getting any REM sleep. Joseph couldn't wait to test his theory. It was simple. He would question his patients to see if they were dreaming or not. If they reported they weren't dreaming, it would mean they weren't getting the deep REM sleep they needed. Dreaming was the key to their energy, vitality, and life. Joseph surmised that patients who dream should have energy and feel good. It was a simple experiment that he could test right away. Tom put his hand out to shake Joseph's. It sounds like you're on to something, Doc. I can't wait to hear the outcome. Keep me posted. Life's too short not to dream. Joseph shook hands with Tom, eager to test his theory. Over the next several days, Joseph asked his patients about their dreams. With each patient, he wrote in his notebook, name, dreaming, yes or no, energy, yes or no, medications for energy, depression, vitality, yes or no. The notebook proved conclusive. Patient after patient confirmed his theory. The tired and depressed patients, the ones who had no energy and tended to be the sickest, weren't dreaming. The patients who had lots of energy and vitality and tended to be the healthiest were dreaming. Again, Joseph reached out to his colleagues and friends, the ones who would still speak to him. They shunned his theory. His last remaining friends began to turn their backs on him. Joseph's closest friend in school tried to rationalize with him by explaining that it was natural to get tired as people age. He told Joseph to keep filling prescriptions, the blue and red labeled bottles. In a last desperate attempt, Joseph tried to get through to his older brother, the renowned surgeon. Joseph, this is the last time I'm going to tell you, his brother lectured. There is nothing wrong with decreasing energy levels as people get older. You've already made a bad name for yourself in the medical community. Try not to make it worse. And, more importantly, you're starting to tarnish my name with your ridiculous, off-the-wall obsession. Drop this lunatic theory of yours, or please don't show up at my house again. Joseph got the point. His theory was not welcome. A few weeks passed as Joseph dwelled on creating a fix, a solution so people could start dreaming again. He figured that finding the answer was the only way to validate his theory, and he was going to have to go at it alone. One night, as Joseph prepared for bed, he paused and looked at his reflection in the mirror. Why are people so tired? Joseph asked aloud. It's because they aren't dreaming. But why aren't people dreaming? he asked as he continued the conversation with himself. Because they aren't getting REM sleep, came the reply. But why aren't they getting REM sleep? Joseph asked, trying to deduce a solution. That was the question. Joseph rested his head on his pillow, eyes wide open, staring at the ceiling. His mind raced, trying to come up with a plausible solution. Obviously, people aren't getting REM sleep because the body is resisting this stage of sleep. But why would the body resist deep, restorative sleep? Joseph wondered as he drifted off to sleep. The sand was soft under his feet. He laid back and enjoyed the tide as it rode in and washed over his legs. The sun setting on the horizon and the cool breeze relaxed Joseph. He breathed deeply. Air effortlessly filled his lungs. He exhaled slowly. Out of the corner of his eye, he saw someone walking along the beach. He thought he was alone, the only one within miles of this spot. Joseph got to his feet. It appeared to be a woman. Her back was to Joseph. She had long, dark, wavy hair that flowed in the evening breeze. Joseph began to walk towards her. He estimated she was at least 50 yards away. Joseph picked up his pace, trying to close the gap. He wasn't making any headway. He picked up his pace to a jog. Hello? Joseph shouted. He didn't want to scare her, but his curiosity overtook his precaution. She didn't turn, her back still facing Joseph. Joseph jog turned into a run. He was barely making any headway, even though she appeared to just be strolling along the beachfront where the waves crashed into the shore. Joseph's run turned into a sprint. He was finally starting to close the gap. From behind, she appeared to be as beautiful and radiant as the falling sun on the horizon. Her long blue dress blew in the wind. Hello? 
Joseph shouted. Still no response. Surely she can hear me, Joseph thought, as he closed to about 25 yards away. Hi, can you hear me? Joseph tried again, still sprinting at full steam ahead. It made no sense. She seemed to barely be walking, slowly putting one foot in front of the other, while Joseph was getting short of breath from his sheer exertion. Ten yards, he was getting closer. Hello? He muttered, running out of breath. No response. Five yards. Excuse me? Joseph struggled to get words out now. The mysterious woman still didn't turn. One yard. She was nearly within reach. Joseph was at his all-out max sprint. He reached out for her arm. Hi! Joseph gasped, barely able to get the words out through his labored breathing. He lunged, inches from touching the stranger on the beach. With a gasp, Joseph shot up in his bed. Panting, heart racing, sweat dripping, Joseph struggled to catch his breath. He couldn't believe how real the dream felt, how intensely he wanted to see her face. Joseph got up and splashed water on his face. He looked at his reflection in the mirror. He shut his eyes, thinking back to the dream, the girl on the beach, the intense struggle trying to see her. His eyes popped open. Of course! He almost shouted. It was obvious now. The answer to his question, why weren't people getting REM sleep, revealed itself in his dream. It's harder to breathe in the dream state, Joseph smiled as he started to catch his breath. Joseph reasoned the body resisted the dream state, REM sleep, because breathing was more difficult in this stage of sleep. It made sense. Muscles become paralyzed during REM sleep to prevent the body from acting out its dreams. With the muscles in an immobile, relaxed state, the airway becomes narrower, making breathing more difficult. Joseph's deductive logic was sound. People were tired because they weren't dreaming. They weren't dreaming because the body was resisting this stage of sleep. The body resisted deep stage REM sleep because breathing was more difficult in this level of sleep. Dreaming can cause the body some discomfort, therefore it avoids it. The solution, Joseph determined, was to create a device to make it easier to breathe while sleeping. If breathing was easier, the body wouldn't have any problems going into REM sleep. Then people would start dreaming again. Why try and figure things out on my own, Joseph mused. Might as well just sleep on them and let the answers come to me. Joseph shook his head with a smile as he dressed for the day. For weeks, Joseph was distracted from his patients. He was deep in his head, trying to think through the intricacies of the device. Joseph obsessively thought about the device. Every evening, Joseph came home and detailed his daily insights on paper. He drew designs and variations on every possible way the device could connect and integrate with the patient and function to improve breathing. The design had to be elegant. It had to be comfortable and biocompatible, but it also mechanical and functional. Joseph ran some numbers. He calculated the time it would take to build a prototype. He estimated and added up the potential cost for materials and testing. Then Joseph had a familiar feeling. He felt the restrictions he had felt at graduation. This time, it was tangible. To create this device, he was going to have to leave everything he had worked for behind. The doctor before his name, the practice and patience, his safe and secure income, his profession, and what little esteem of being a doctor he had left. Joseph thought of all the sacrifices he had made to get to this point, the long journey, the rigorous studies. He felt the strong grip of resistance, trying to hold on to what he had worked so hard to become. He felt the tension between this grip, wanting to hold on to what was known and the unknown possibilities of letting go. It was a lot to give up. He wasn't sure if he could break free from it. The grip was tight. Could this theory be right and the whole world oblivious to it? Could I really know something and make something that no one else had thought of or done before? He was going to sleep on it. Joseph continued treating patients in his practice. His theory continued to prove itself. Not once had he found a patient who was tired and depressed, but still dreamed. The correlation between dreaming and having energy and vitality and not dreaming and being tired and depressed was perfect. Every night, Joseph ran through options in his head. Option one, he could continue in his practice. 
He would prescribe blue and red labeled pills, make a good income, and live securely all the way to death. He would forget about this dreaming thing and regain the support and camaraderie of his family and friends. He would live with the prestige of being a doctor and have the satisfaction of a respectable life. Option two, he could attempt to create this device that has only been seen in his imagination and that no one else believes in. He would have to spend all his money, all his time, risk everything, and maybe it would work. Maybe it wouldn't. His family would be upset that he threw everything away, angry for his financial irresponsibility, and worried about his mental health. His friends would scoff at his naivety and stupidity. In the silence of his lonely existence, he would hear the whisperings of others talking of his insanity. Joseph couldn't help but notice that option two didn't seem too pleasing. Option number one seemed much more appealing. He couldn't decide. Little did he know, not making a decision was a decision nonetheless. Joseph's daily routine of seeing patients continued. A month passed. Ah! Joseph awoke before dawn with a searing headache, a pounding in his head. He sat up, holding his head with both hands, applying heavy pressure to his temples. It was Sunday morning, and he didn't have to be up for several hours. Ba-boom. 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 His head felt like it was literally shaking from the beating. Joseph stumbled out of bed to get dressed. The pounding in his head was so extreme, he couldn't bend over to tie his shoes. He had to get to the office. Fumbling with his key to unlock the office door, he was finally able to match the lock and key and get in. He ripped open the prescription cabinet, grabbed the red-labeled medication, and stuffed a handful of pills down his throat. He lay on the exam table, waiting and praying for the pounding to stop. After several agonizing minutes, the drug started doing its job. The drumming quieted. From that day on, Joseph had a new routine. Every morning, he awoke to a drumming in his head. He would proceed to stumble to his medicine cabinet and pull out the red-labeled pills he had prescribed for himself. He would take the pills and lay back down until the drumming had quieted enough to start his day. After weeks of implementing this new routine, the drumming was finally starting to abate. It was finally getting softer and slower. And so was Joseph. He didn't see as many patients as he did a few months ago. He stopped asking them about their sleep and dreams. Joseph needed naps in the middle of the day to get him through the afternoon. He couldn't be seen without a cup of coffee in his hand. At home, he found himself snoring on the couch shortly after dinner. Joseph was glad he had ostracized himself from his friends, family, and peers, as he had no interest or energy for socializing. He was unhappy. Joseph decided to prescribe himself the blue-labeled pills to accompany his red ones. One Sunday morning, Joseph awoke to the beat of a light drumming in his head that he had become accustomed to. Some painkillers, and shortly, he'd be fine. As Joseph arrived at the office, he was stopped in his tracks. His first patient was already there, beaming. Hey, Doc! It was Tom, his attire as high class as before. To Joseph, Tom's greeting sounded like a shout. The drumming came back with a vengeance. I'm going to need some more painkillers, Joseph thought as he dragged himself into his office. You're early, Joseph remarked. Yes, sir. I hate to waste sunshine by sleeping away. And I had another wild dream I have to tell you about, Tom excitedly replied. It hit Joseph like a hammer. Dream? I can't remember the last time I had a dream. The drumming was at full force. Tom hopped onto the exam table as he asked, By the way, how's that sleep experiment going? There was something about this man. He exuded energy, enthusiasm, and life. Joseph couldn't lie to him. He desperately wanted to say that his theory was wrong, that he was wrong. He wanted to shove a handful of painkillers down his throat to silence the beating drum in his head. Tom's presence and questions were dredging up the idea Joseph had abandoned months ago. The experiment was pretty, um, conclusive, Joseph honestly and sheepishly replied. That's great, Tom exclaimed. So, have you thought of a solution? Well, I had an idea. Joseph wasn't sure how Tom was getting this out of him. He hadn't thought of the device in months. And, Tom prodded. And, well, I'm not sure it'll work. 
Why not? Tom asked, unrelenting to Joseph's apathy. Well, um, it's never been made before. Of course it's never been made before, Tom bellowed. If it had been, we wouldn't be having this discussion. Tom put his hand on Joseph's shoulder and asked, Do you think you can make it? I did some calculations a while back. It would take all my time and the little money I've managed to save. Ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. Joseph squeezed the back of his neck. Doc, with all due respect, that's selfish. The world needs this from you. Don't keep it from them. It doesn't even exist. How am I keeping it from them? Joseph responded defensively. Have you imagined it? Do you believe you can make it? Tom persisted. I guess so. Well, then it's possible. If you bury it and keep it from the world, you're holding back a gift. Selfishly. Joseph knew he was right. It was clear what he had to do. Tom unburied the device that Joseph had deeply covered with pills and fear disguised as rationalizations. His self-justifications truly were the voice of hell. You're right. I'm going to make it. In that moment, Joseph took a leap. He stared into the face of fear. Instead of retreating, this time he jumped right into it. He committed. He was going to create it. The drumming that was becoming deafening silenced. The calm in his head was as refreshing as a still lake at dawn. The fogginess that had bogged him down for weeks cleared. Colors brightened. Energy returned. Joseph had his assistant cancel appointments for the rest of the day, the rest of the week, and indefinitely. He closed his practice that day. Joseph's practicality was revealed for what it was. Fear. Confronting this fear head-on, Joseph relinquished the comfort and security of his profession, the DR, doctor, he had worked his life on attaining, and released the grip that had held on so tightly to the safety of the status quo. He was liberated from the confinement of conforming to the conventional. He was free. Joseph spent the next couple weeks getting his affairs in order. He sold his nice home in the upscale suburbs, He sold all his possessions except for the bare essentials. He found his new lab, a one-room apartment, in the outskirts of the city. It was a cheap apartment, but it backed to a beautiful, small, tree-lined lake. He bought a workbench, an easel for design work, and materials. He unrolled his massive periodic table that he had stored away years ago. He pinned it up. It completely covered the bare wall. His lab was ready. The first night in his lab, Joseph sat next to the lone window, watching the sun set and fireflies start to glow. His future had never been so uncertain, yet he had never been so free. It was like the chains and tensions of normal life were lifted, and he could go, do, and be as his heart desired. With this freedom came a sense of awe, openness, and infinity. The impossibilities of the sleep device seemed not only possible, but imminent and assured. He felt powerful with a sense of invincibility. He felt he was in charge of his destiny. For once, instead of constantly reacting, Joseph had acted. As he stared out the window, looking over the small lake behind his lab, Joseph saw movement among the shadows. The leaves on the tree that lined the lake rustled. The evening breeze was quiet yet steady. Joseph made out the shadow of a person. It was a woman. She looked familiar. Her dress and hair waved in the wind. She looks just like the woman in that dream, Joseph thought. No sooner than he had the thought, the woman glanced in the direction of Joseph's window. It was her. In that instant, his eyes connected with the most captivating eyes he had ever seen. Her deep blue eyes contrasted against her long, dark hair. Even in the fading sunlight, he could see how beautiful she was. As Joseph stared out the window, his attention was diverted by a firefly that landed on the windowsill and lit up right before him. When Joseph looked back up, she was gone. Joseph had always wanted to believe in serendipity and that things happen for a reason. He wanted to believe in omens and signs. He wondered who this beautiful woman was and what she was trying to tell him. He pondered the dream she was in that revealed the insight to his sleep device the dream that ultimately led him to his lab. Joseph spent the next six months in his lab. 
He etched designs on his easel. He combined, mixed, and matched materials. He tested, experimented, and iterated. He breathed and dreamed. This concludes part one of Your Drum. I wanted to tell you a couple ways you can continue listening uh, to part two and part three. Of course, you can go to Amazon and also get the audiobook on Audible and iTunes, as well as on the website, you can click on free chapters and register to get free chapters, and I show you how you can get the rest of the book, both in print and audio, uh, however you'd like to listen or continue reading. The website is www.yourdrum.org. And again, thank you so much for reading and spending your time with me. I look forward to continuing with you in parts two and three.